outside your cute office, not my office, still playing with backgrounds. Somebody asked me to give you guys some more details on the steps you take to click into place the thing that might be holding you back from passing the RPR testimony leg, the Q&A. Q&A was always my nemesis in school. I just thought I wasn't good at it. It was that it was just that simple. And so after 40 years of reporting, um, and gosh, you know, I, I'm a freelance reporter, so I'm doing depositions mostly and Q&A all the time. And I think through sheer will and brute force, I have overcome my dislike for Q&A. Um, I would much rather just sit and be able to write the words that flow to me from one speaker, but that ain't the nature of our job for the most part. So what I discovered in a really weird way was, well, it may not be the secret for everybody for passing the Q&A, but for four out of four in a row, students and reporters that I worked with who were having trouble consistently, it passed all the other parts of the RPR, but repeatedly had not passed the Q&A. Four out of four where I worked with them um, within a five day period before they took the test and they passed. And, oh, I'm, you know, with me, I've realized lately that it's either five days or five weeks, either after we work together, even if it's just a conversational hypnosis session, five days or five weeks, depending on your neurology and how hard that part of you is holding you back, whether we can override it very quickly within five days and get you the results before that part kicks back in and says, I didn't think you could do that. I was trying to stop you <laughs> as it does different video or five weeks. Cause sometimes it takes that long for things to sift through and process through your neurology to get the changes that you want for that part to relax and realize that you're not going to die. If you pass a test, life goes on sometimes fabulously better. Anyway, back to Q&A. I came up with this concept and it seemed preposterous to me at first. And so, Danae, um, if you see this video and you want to comment, I would love it. She was my first guinea pig. Bless her heart. <clears throat> um she came to me and and said, "I need help. I'm I'm having double trouble passing the the Q and A part of the of the RPR." And I flat out asked her, "Did you come from a beginning of early in your life um, confusion, uh, chaos, um, arguments, people fighting?" Um, and I thought that's kind of a weird lead in <laughs> for anybody, but I was. I was short on time and I had just within two, three days before that come away from a session where I was the practice client and one of my hypnosis students was the practice therapist. And she had taken me back because I'd asked, you know, I don't know what is this shit that happens, not just with Q&A, but especially when two attorneys start going at it. Um, you know, I object, you can't object, no speaking objections, I'm going to take you to go, it's just that bullshit. Um, and we all feel it, because even if they're not talking fast, or it feels like they're talking faster. And there, there would be this surge of scaredness that would swell up, well up in my body. And um, I, I mean, I'd literally feel myself pushing away from the machine. I mean, I'm trying to write, but there it is. And, and pushing myself back in the chair. Um, and I wanted to know what the hell is that? You know, and okay, I've always from like 160s when we, what, that was my school. First time we heard about Q&A um, was in 160s. And I wanted to know from that moment, it was hard for me. And I kept thinking, it'll get easier. It'll get better. It'll get easier. It'll get, it has gotten easier and better, um, but it shouldn't be this hard, really. And in this practice session I did with this other now therapist, 
She said, I want you to feel the feelings that you're feeling in your body before um, this happens and then feel the feelings that you feel when the two attorneys start at it. And there's two people in the room who are obviously disagreeing. And boy, yeah, I could feel it. Just identified it immediately. It's like it's either up in my heart or in my chest or it's in my stomach. Um, and sometimes it's like racing all over the place. Um, I, I'm like pr prickly feelings all in my arms, in my hands. <laughs> it, But those are sensations that happen when that if, when when you're feeling overwhelmed in those circumstances. And for me, it was always Q&A. <laughs> It was like literary. I didn't like it. It was hard, but I knew it was like one voice coming at me. I could do it. So what was the difference? So in this practice session she gave me, she asked me to just feel the feeling and then go back to a time, a place, an event where it was the earliest time or an early time when I could remember feeling those feelings and to just let my brain float until it found a memory and boom, there I was. And I could literally feel the wall against my back. Um, and in, in hypnosis, the way that I do it, you're always relatively consciously aware of what's happening. I want you to remember because there's power in awareness. This is what separates the kind of therapy I do from regular hypnosis where they just kind of knock you out and start giving you the new thought patterns, which after five, six, seven, eight sessions, one week at a time, um, you, you can override that stuff. But what we like to do is go in, find out where the problem started, why it started, get rid of it, and then put in a new thought pattern. And it's your conscious, deliberate awareness and wanting that changes everything quickly sometimes in most of the time with us, one session and that's it. Or one session, you get the results, come back in six months when you're going for a new certification or you're in a new job situation, whatever. So in the session, she's guiding me through it and she's saying, feel the feelings. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling the wall behind me. How old are you? Oh, I don't know. I'm probably about four years old because I know that house and we only lived there till I was five. So I was probably four. What's going on in front of you? And I said, oh, it's my parents. What's happening? What are you hearing? What's going on? Well, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're fighting with each other. And she said, what happens when that happens? Well, bad things sometimes happen. Really, really bad things sometimes happen. And the next question was, what do you need to do when that happens? I got to go hide. I got to get out of here. I can't be the target. If I'm in their visual line of sight, I'm going to be the target. And, and not only can somebody get hurt, I'm going to get hurt. What do you need to do? I got to hide. I got to go in my bedroom or any, even if it's really bad in my closet and hide. I've got to get out of here. And I'm going to choke up because in that instant, I realized that part of me that was very wise and trying to protect me and bringing to my attention, uh-oh, they're starting to fight again, go hide. Before it even starts, go hide. Get the hell out of here. Go be safe. That part of me had been running as a program my whole life. Probably in instances where I saw where I wasn't reporting, where I saw people fighting or arguing, I probably went the other way. Don't want to get in the middle of this. I'm out of here. Um, not the mediator. Uh, uh. And here I am. You know, I was four years old. Been reporting for 43, almost 44 years. I'll be 67 next month. And this has been a program that's been going on that whole time. That blew me away. Like, really? I mean... I didn't know it. I didn't see it. I didn't feel it. I didn't understand it. It happens every time, but I couldn't correlate it to anything except that, well, I guess I just don't like Q&A. <laughs> what a funny profession for you to pick, Carrie, um, to not want people that don't agree. Nobody agrees. If they agreed, they wouldn't be suing each other. 
if they agreed, they wouldn't be asking questions and challenging each other and then objecting and arguing and all that stuff that they do. And I just was dumbfounded that seriously, is that it? It can't be it. Except that because she worked me through, and this is what I want you to take away. If you came from that situation, if you have that kind of program still underlying the surface, first of all, I want you to allow yourself to go back and feel what that younger version of you felt just for a second, just to identify that you understand what it must have felt like to be in a position where you had no control and you were possibly in danger and bad things happened. And, they, and to be so grateful for that part of you that stepped in and said, oh, this is scary stuff and you need to be safe and I, I will help you be safe. And I will keep helping you be safe every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's, it's my job, I'm good at it. And then you don't have to worry. Anytime I see two people not getting along, not their voices are raised or the tempo gets speeded up that um, I will protect you. I will remind you by feelings in your body, by panic, by anxiety, by nervousness, by just that uneasy feeling, by some other element in my brain firing off while I'm trying to hear the words and I'm writing that says, you're not safe. You might want to get out of here, which was my tendency to push back in the chair was to try to distance myself from what was happening. Holy wow. So what we need to do, what she did with me, which was amazing. This is the part I want you to do for you. Um, do it yourself, conscious awareness therapy is to honor that part of you that was trying to protect you, that was stepping in to say, this is possibly not safe. And then to bring yourself to now, to today, and to have a conversation that goes something like this. What is your job now? Well, my job is to write down everything everybody says, no matter what, unless it's totally beyond my abilities and then I have got to interrupt them, but that's a different video. I need to capture the record, okay? And in doing that, 99% of the time, are you safe? Yeah, of course I am, yeah, I'm safe. Well, how about that 1% of the time when you're sitting there going, hmm, am I safe? Are they going to get out of control or are they going to attack me in a minute? Because I, I have had depots where the videographer was busy clearing out the, the space under the table so he and I could dive if we needed to because I thought these two were going to go across the table and at each other. So I consider that my 1% where I'm not sure I'm safe. But my videographer's got my back. So we got a place to dive. And it was a nice, big, heavy granite table. So yeah, on the 34th, 34th floor in a building on California Street whew, in San Francisco years and years ago. Anyway, to ask myself, am I safe? Well, of course I am. Um, do you realize that you used to need a part of you to keep you safe when people didn't get along? when people argued, when people confronted each other and got verbally nasty sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I needed that part. And, and that part did a really good job because otherwise I wouldn't be alive today. So let's honor that part and say, thank you. God, thank you, wise part of me for stepping in when I was just a little kid and I had no control and I had no support and I had nobody but you and you stepped in to take care of me, to protect me, to keep me alive. But I grew up and I learned other skills along the way and I can keep me safe. I am the one in the room. Get this, when I'm in a deposition, when I'm in a place of taking testimony with two people talking, I am the safe place. I am the neutral party in the room that is there to collect 
to capture, to grab all the words that are said, to put them down forever so that a judge, somebody else can deal with these people to help them resolve their problems. Because that's not my problem. <laughs> I do not have a dog in this fight. I am there doing the most amazing job. And they can rest assured that with me behind my equipment, they are safe because I am the safe place in the room. I've got this and I know how to protect myself. And if there comes a time when I feel like I actually may not be safe, well, I know how to deal with that. I know what I would do. I know what I would say. And to have those things already be a comfortable voice that comes up in you to tell people that it's all right, everything is absolutely fine, that I am safe, I keep me safe. Younger part of you that was trying to keep me safe, you didn't know I grew up along the way. You didn't get the memo saying, I got this now, I'm okay now. I don't need you to warn me when people are arguing because I can deal with that and I can take care of it. But now that you know what I know, you can let go. You can stop trying to warn me because I don't need you doing that. And you can actually, sometimes that part will just back off and go, oh, okay, cool. She's got it. She's safe. She's good. And it might watch from a distance and say, mm, just to be sure, I want to watch and make sure that she knows that she's okay, that she's got it. Oh, look at that. And, and give it a job. Tell it, I want you to watch me from a distance. And I want you to come back later and tell me if there's a different way I could have handled something or a different way I could have perceived it or for you to know that I am safe and that I am in control and that I have those abilities now and that you can spend your energy doing something else. Finding me that great job tomorrow with six attorneys who are all going to order copies. You know, just the, the, the beautiful part of you that that part of you is is ultimately powerful and and in, in a in not in an overtaking way, but in a if you let me come to the surface, I can help you create miracles in your life. And it can. But for today, ask yourself, what was my environment when I was first growing up? What did it feel like? Did I have control? Did I have support? Did I have unconditional love? Or did I, was, was my presence conditional? I'll love you if, you're all right if, um, you can, you know, not be abandoned, maybe even loved, if. If there was an if in your childhood, and oh, let me tell you, we all got ifs, you know? If there was an if, just look at it. Just accept that, well, okay, you know, that was my beginning. And possibly, that is part of the reason I picked court reporting because there would be that environment where people weren't getting along and I would have all kinds of opportunities to grow and to be able to get past not being in control, not having support, even of my own, not being safe. I will choose a profession where that's in my face every day and I will grow from it. And some of us, it takes longer than others. But um, the change is there. The magic is there. Being aware of what's going on will change your life. If anybody has any questions, or if you need a little bit of deeper diving or anything, please just let me know. I love you guys. Go question and answer.